Hello, my name is Patrick O'Neill. I am a PhD student at Texas A&M where I work with Dr. Sunil Chiria. And today I will be presenting uh, on a project entitled Nuclear Forensics Methodology Development by Employing Machine Learning Methods to Enable Foreign Nuclear Fuel Cycle Monitoring. So the objective of this is to use machine learning techniques to produce a robust nuclear forensics methodology capable of identifying a separated plutonium samples, reactor type of origin, fuel burnup, and time sensor radiation, uh, which will enable us to better monitor foreign nuclear fuel cycles. Uh, previous work at Texas A&M has produced machine learning or produced methodologies that are capable of uh, identifying those three attributes in separated plutonium, uh, but none of them so far have been able to accurately identify plutonium samples which have been mixed or spoofed, um, which means it's a mixture of plutonium from maybe multiple different reactor types or uh, with varying fuel burnups and TSI values. And so that's a special point of emphasis for our methodology is it should be able to do that. So why is this relevant to the NNSA? Uh, nuclear forensics techniques uh, can help uh, to act as a deterrent to uh, nuclear uh, material smuggling uh, because it enables um, the, the adversaries to be identified. Uh, and, and punished as a result. Um, and this methodology can also be used to verify declared activities uh, that occur at facilities that are under nuclear safeguards agreements. So I said there had been previous work done on methodology development at Texas A&M. Uh, most, our most recent attempt uh, is, is this machine learning attempt. And so far we've been able to produce a methodology that is able to attribute pure plutonium samples uh, and we can do this for five different reactor types, uh, three of which, uh, PWR, PHWR, and FBR are generic designs based off of um, what's out there, as well as um, irradiation positions at two research reactors, Hyfer and Murr, which are at Oak Ridge and uh, the University of Missouri, respectively. Uh, our methodology is capable of attributing on a fuel burnup range of zero to five gigawatt days per MTU and a TSI range of zero to 5,000 days. And we can see kind of how this process is, is done on this flow sheet. Um, there's three main steps uh, with a small pre-processing step right before, uh, but the three main steps is reactor classification, which is done using a support vector machine classifier uh, and a set of a specific set of isotopic ratios. Um, that feeds into a set of uh, Gaussian process regression models, which are capable of burnup quantification. And then the TSI calculation is done analytically. Um, and all of the data that is used to train those um, machine learning models and the reference library that the TSI calculation uses uh, was all produced using MCMP um, burnup uh, simulations. So, how do we? advance to identifying mixed plutonium with, with that as our starting point. Uh, so the main change will be in the reactor classification process. Uh, instead of having five reactor class, classes in our classifier, um, we add classes that are characteristic of mixed plutonium between those classes. So instead of having five pure reactor classes, we're now going to have 15 with an addition of 10 uh, mixed uh, classes. Uh, so the big challenge is that in that is we need to train or we need to change how our training data uh, is produced. Um, and so before we would sample um, from the we would sample a, a TSI a burnout value and a reactor type, uh, and then we would take our reference data that we had, uh, interpolate between burn steps and decay to to represent uh, the TSI. Um, and we would do that for the ratio values themselves. Uh, now we need to be sampling more values. We need to be sampling, you know, a mixing percentage. How mixed is this new class uh, or, or data in this new class? Um, and uh, we also need to be uh, doing the interpolation and the uh, decaying with the actual uh, isotope quantity values, and then. Uh, making uh, the, the ratios. So um, so that was the big challenge and, and that's been 
um, accomplished and uh, some special areas of interest as we, we train different models um, is the optimal machine learning model. Uh, what is it still a support vector machine for classification or, or is there a more suitable one out there? Um, we also wanted to know what our optimal training data set size was to uh, where we could act accurately um, predict these mixed classes uh, while not getting too bad, bogged down in, in having a huge training data set um, or you know, potentially overfitting a huge training data set. Uh, and we also wanted to know what kind of threshold uh, could we have as far as the mixture of two uh, different reactor types? You know, what is too small of an amount to be detected uh, if effectively? So uh, here's how our classifier is performing right now. We're using a an, an support vector machine still uh, that seemed to be the best, that, you know, had the best numbers um, with the quadratic kernel. Uh, its accuracy is 97.3%. Uh, it has a log loss of 0 0.694. Um, for a 15 class classifier, a benchmark on log loss would be 2.71. And we're much lower than that. So we're very happy with that. Um, we found a mixing limit of, of 15%. Uh, so uh, between fifth, you know, two constituents, if one's under 15%, it becomes much harder to identify that it's a mixed plutonium class. Um, and we found a good training data set size was 3,000 or roughly 200 uh, data points per class. Um, and that's big enough to be accurate at the level that we want. And it's also uh, small enough that it, it trains very quickly. So uh, we're happy with that. Uh, so looking at the confusion matrix of the classifier, uh, this is a tool that we can use just to make sure that um, you know all of our, our misses are not coming from one class or there's not two classes that are, are problem children. Uh, and looking at it, um, we're very happy with this performance. Um, most classes are um, are performing very well. Uh, the only maybe area of investigation that we want to look at is classes 15 and classes 11 uh, seem to misidentify to each other. Uh, so we might want to dive a little bit more into the data there and see what uh, overlaps in their isotope ratio sets uh, might be causing that. So uh, we can also compare our receiver operating characteristic curves between the SVM classifier and different classifiers that we tested. Um, so this is basically analyzing a true positive rate versus a false positive rate. Um, a completely kind of the benchmark is you want your curves to be above um, a linear line from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Um, so if, if you're in the upper half, you know, that's good performance. If you're in the lower half, that's bad performance. Um, the SVM classifier, all 15 classes perform really well. Um, a big note is the, the Y axis is 0 0.9 to one. It's usually zero to one, but if I did zero to one, then it's just, you wouldn't really be able to see any information, right? It just would be a straight line up and a straight line over. Um, and it performs better uh, than the ROC curves for a naive base classifier and a K nearest neighbor classifier, which you can see on the right, um, which definitely um, have some classes that, that don't perform as well. So uh, again, this points to the SVM class, classifier being uh, the one to use in this situation. Uh, so what is the expected inf uh, impact of this? Um, the, the ultimate aim of this is we want to develop a tool that we can put in the hands of decision makers. Um, and, and some of the decisions we've made in this methodology development have, have reflected that. Um, and we want to be able to improve the ability of the nuclear safeguard community uh, to monitor uh, different fuel cycles uh, by um, ensuring that we can best verify material declarations. Uh, what impact has MTV had on this project? Um, first off, the collaborations that have been enabled by MTV have been absolutely vital to the success of this project. Um, the reason we started using machine learning was primarily because we were able to uh, collaborate with Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, and, and that was a really important part of getting it off the ground. And we've also been collaborating with Sandia National Lab on some of the 
uncertainty quantification aspects of this project. And, and those collaborations were very successful. Uh, also, uh, being able to build connections with researchers at other universities through different MTV events, um, it's very rare that you get to meet uh, other researchers who uh, do some of the same things as you and are eager to talk about it, right? Um, and that definitely happens at MTV events. So that's uh, that's been really awesome. And also um, skill development has uh, is been a big part of this. I was not someone who had really known much about machine learning before I started. And now um, it's something I use uh, very heavily for my research. Um, and that's it. You know, that continues beyond just me. I, you know, we get undergrads in our lab and we get younger grad students in our lab, you know, group. And I, if, if this is a skill that they want to learn, I can teach them because I was, you know, I had to learn this for, for uh, this project for MTV. So that's um, going to have a big impact at Texas A&M even probably after I, I leave. Um, so the big conclusions here is our preliminary efforts uh, to incorporate mixed plutonium classes uh, in our ML methodology has been successful. Um, and we're uh, happy to move forward with this in the future. Um, we found some of the operational limits that ha this methodology has. Um, there's some other things we wanna, wanna probe and test. Um, the most important thing moving into the future is we do want validation data. Uh, and we're, that's something we're working on within our lab and, and how this classifier performs with that validation data will be kind of the, the most important benchmark for us to hit. Uh, so some future work that we wanna do, uh, we wanna look at um, the features that we wanna do a sensitivity study. You can see an, an MR, MR plot on the left, which is kind of a preliminary start to that. Um, that's minimum redundancy, maximum relevancy uh, chart. And it has a comparison between mixed uh, PU classifier data sets and unmixed. Um, and kind of the thing we can see here is as you include mixed classes, all of your features become a little bit more important relative to each other, right? So there's a, almost a flattening of um, you need more information, um, except for europium, which uh, I guess is not very useful in, in uh, in the mixed data set, although that won't really bear out until we train new models and, and see how they perform. Uh, some other things that we want to do uh, is maybe produce a model for once we've identified a mixed class, um, a model that's capable of telling you how mixed they are. Uh, we want to do that validation that I talked about, and we also want to uh, improve our uncertainty quantification in our predictions. Um, you know how. Having a prediction is, is useful. Having a prediction with a confidence is much more useful. And we want to be doing that to the best of our abilities. So um, we have some metrics that we use, but we're always looking to, uh, to investigate that further. Uh, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge the consortium uh, for funding this research, uh, the consortium and the NNSA, of course, uh, for funding this research. And uh, thank you for your time.